It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slave. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slave. Hello everyone and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And welcome to the official Superhero Slate review of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Woo! Man, Go I'd team. have to track down all of those unofficial reviews. Uh, that's yeah. probably got to be the uh, the AI trained bots, right? Yeah. That have mm-hmm. been scraping all of the audio all, from all, us. All the inside the magic articles or the yeah you know, the big freaking robot articles. That, you know, you yeah, click from the, the from the last four hundred episodes. Yeah. Those are unofficial. I don't yeah. know what those Dude, robots thought about Ant Man and the Wasp. Do you remember when we found that podcast channel that was just stealing our episodes and reposting them on YouTube? Oh my gosh, oh, yeah. it's like we are not that popular. No, enough we are not to just be scraping and putting us out there. So that's what i'm trying to say robots are indiscriminate mm-hmm. some of them are even made and designed only for killing yes uh, we'll talk about that a little bit only <laughs> for podcasting if you will yeah. um but yes yes yeah, so ant-man and wasps uh quantum mania is now in theaters uh we were able to see it i caught it thursday night mike you watched it saturday right um saturday morning saturday morning very much very mm-hmm. i was like it was afternoon for me but it was morning for you for sure um i was gonna say the other thing this is the the first uh, trilogy of movies we've been able to cover since we started this show because Ant Man came out the first year we started doing this. Um, oh, our first review yeah, was you're... was uh, Age of Ultron, and then you know Ant Man was the next one after that. So I guess I guess you're right. So this is maybe a bit of a seminal moment for us. Yes, oh, it's uh, so emotional. <laughs> but also, as we always say on our individual review episodes, we're going to start spoiler free the best we can, and then the lion share or the ants yeah. share, the Kang share of this mm. review will primarily be uh, spoilers. So don't worry, we'll let you know before we jump into any big, massive, major spoilers. Uh, but this was this this is kind of uh, hard to wrap my head around in a way of like I'm so used to like Ant Man movies like being the uh, punctuation marks. To mm-hmm. phases, right? It's just usually like a well, little period, like I, after that, some sort of big Avengers I, I movie, and say, now it's like the opposite. Well, this is yeah. supposed to start something, right? They're more like ellipses, right? In between, you know, big events, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the first eight main was between Age of Ultron and Civil War, which was essentially two Avengers movies back to back. And then Ant Man and the Wasp was what well, in between. Um, Infinity War and I believe was it Captain Marvel or Thor? One of the two. Or maybe it's between Thor and Captain Marvel. I don't know. But you mentioned it, 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 they are not usually um, quote unquote tentpole films for the MCU's events at large, if you will. Yeah. And also, uh, speaking of trilogy, I think the only other film in the MCU, speaking of trilogy wise, would be Spider Man with director John Watts yes. that has had the same director carry through um, yeah. all three movies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and um, the, this one is um, oh my gosh, Peyton Reed, obviously, mm-hmm. and I believe he is going on to do Fantastic Four. Is that right? That's that's his next. Um, is that his next gig in Marvel? I mean, it, it's hard to well, say. I'm on his I am. I'm on his IMDb right now, and he does not have anything in the uh, up and coming. Uh, section as of right now, but I think he no, was at least no, rumored it was briefly. Matt, Matt Shackman's doing it. Um, it was a Spider Man guy who was gonna. So you, we mentioned Spider. It's the mm-hmm. Spider Man guy who was gonna do it, and he went and did. Um, he went and did that Star Wars show, uh, the, the Skeleton Crew. Mm-hmm. But yeah. but in in terms of stars, Peyton Reed has done the Mandalorian episodes, um, mm-hmm. including two episodes of season two, including the season finale. Right, the the infamous Mandalorian season two, where we get to see you know. Um, the dark troopers, right? Uh, yes. Be wrecked some, by Luke. Yeah, some semblance uh, of, of what may the ghosts of uh, Mark Hamill. Yeah. His, the ghost of his youth, I guess, is the way yeah. to put it. But yeah, so I, I think this is just, it's interesting in a way of like, 
So I guess to start off just kind of like weird and broad in a way and mm-hmm. not really following any straight narrative of reviewing this movie is just like, how do you, how do we even confine the MCU anymore to right. any sort of like structure, right? Because I, I, for me, it just feels the most familiar to a very long series of television, right? And I feel like some people and even like the studio is going along with this mentality of like, oh, these need to be their own standalone adventures, right? Mm -hmm. They need to encapsulate their own arcs and their own stories. But if I look at like all of three Ant-Man movies on their own, I think it's almost impossible to do, right? Um, Especially (laughs) since so much has happened in between all of the Ant-Man movies. Like, you you know, uh, you even have Paul Rudd in all of his films mentioning other movies and other characters that have never showed up in any of the Ant-Man movies. So it's very it's very strange. I feel like you just you can't review Marvel movies anymore on the basis of them just being their own kind of like standalone mm-hmm. trilogies or franchises anymore. It just doesn't it just yeah. I feel like it just and does not work. It will, to me it's kind of like I would say maybe not one series of television because all of these movies tend to lean into their own genre a bit, right? Like comparing Black Panther Wakanda Forever the last MCU movie to this is very unfair because they are not trying to do the same things at all, right? They are entirely different movies, entirely different feels and tones, uh, drawing on different emotions. But, like, maybe it's more like the like what's one of those shows like NCIS, right? Like, it started with NCIS, and now we have all these spinoffs that are like, oh, this the one's, one's in Los Angeles doing, you know, Los Angeles things, one's in New Orleans doing that, one's in Hawaii. We have, like, I guess, I guess branches. NCIS. <laughs> NCIS Quantum Realm. Yeah, is pretty what much. This but, one feels like. but like you, you know, you you, you kind of nail it here. You know, Ant Man one origin story, cool. Ant Man and the Wasp. I I really don't like that movie in, in hindsight, like compared to the first one, right? Like it's hard. It's mm-hmm. it's it's one of those ones. It's so forgettable. Like when I'm making a list, I forget it even happens, right? Because mm-hmm. it's so yes, in in game could not have happened without Ant Man, but like. Nothing in Ant-Man and the Wasp carried over to this movie, right? I'm going to go ahead and just say that out loud. If you didn't watch it, you're not going to miss anything here, pretty much. Um, except for the, the the part of Janet Van Dyne um, coming mm-hmm. coming back. Uh, which, I'm just going to go ahead and say, she had powers, now she doesn't have powers, Mike. Okay? A little upset. Oh my god, Chris. <laughs> I totally forgot about that it, until you mentioned Ant-Man it. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Just now. <laughs> Ant-Man and the Wasp. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying anything about Quantumania. I'm just saying Ant-Man and the Wasp does not hold up now. Um, after everything has happened, right? And I think it's, like, I would say the weakest link in this bridge of three movies. Um, But all the cool stuff about Ant-Man, to me, is the stuff that probably didn't happen in the movies, Uh, right? Like, you know, um, he is is definitely an Avenger. He's popular. He's doing all this stuff. But, like, I this one very much, um, I would say, uh, I'm not going to read it. It starts off very quick and gets right into the quantum part, like, right out the gate. You know, go ahead, Chris. I I I feel, I feel like we, we yeah. we're starting to roll into it now. I don't yes. want to lose the steam. Yeah, let's do this. What, what did you What did you feel about I, it? Uh, spoiler 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 free. free. If I was to, to, if I'm to rank the Ant Man movies, this is right below one, but well above three or two, if you will. Right? Mm-hmm. Like I think this is way better than Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, but Ant Man still it's still got that unique charm that that you know it's very grounded. Um, if I would say anything, Quantum Mania is the opposite of a grounded movie. It, it is, it is definitely a comic book brought to life in terms of visuals, zaniness, characters coming and going left and right. Um, it, it's I would say if I was to rank, you know, a podcast I listen to uses the two ratings: Mike, best movie ever or worst movie ever. There's nothing in between. <laughs> you get you get that choice, but occasionally you come across one of the reviews where it's just a movie, and uh-huh. I, I'm sad to say that Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumini is just a movie at the end of the day. Like, I don't hate this movie. I, there's nothing about it I don't think I would probably change or or, or, or I'm going to rail on. I, I'm going to have to nitpick to find stuff out. But, like, at the other time, I'm like, I'm not really hyped about it. I'm like, now you got to watch Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumini. I don't think I need to go tell anybody that. And that's kind of what's leaving me in the middle of this, like, just ambivalence towards it. Um which, you know, some people might say, well, that's, that's disappointing. But, like, there's some good stuff in it. Um, but I don't think it elevates to great stuff at all. And, and um, you know, I would say, you know, uh, again, the, the the story, I think, to me, does a, a favor for um, who it focuses on. We have, again, Paul Rudd's Ant-Man. We have a little bit of his daughter. 
Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed how they kind of, I would say, treat, um, you know, Kang. Uh, he, he, I will, I, he's like a, he's there, he's not, you don't see him, but he's there for the first part of the movie. And then you get to him and, um, Jonathan Majors really knocks out of the park. I think, I think the, the casting and, and everybody here does it fine, but like, I just, I, not today, but maybe in five years, I will finally be like, oh, I get what they were trying to do, but today I don't quite feel it. And, um, that just kind of leaves me in the middle, man. I'm just like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, what's next? Guardians of, of the Galaxy. So, uh, it is very hard. It's, it's hard to quantify, Mike, if you will. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a quantum realm of my, my own making, uh, for that. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we can talk about, I feel if we talk about anything, it'll kind of give spoilers away. So I don't want to mm-hmm. get into any beats or, or, or specific details, um, until we get to that point, but I'll go ahead and let you, uh, roll into your thoughts. Cause we, I wouldn't say we're radio silent. We talked a little bit about again. The obviously there's two post credit scenes. We won't talk about them here, but mm. g- go on. Uh, lay lay it lay it on us. Yeah, well, I have the privilege now of going second after Chris, and usually this is kind of like the fun moment where I get to kind of allude to if I am totally opposite of Chris <laughs> and what's the tone of the ne- of the next like you know you know forty thirty oh, yeah. minutes of the podcast going to be, and I get like oh this is going to be a crazy one because I don't know how Chris feels, but I think I can honestly say, and I'm actually kind of relieved, Chris, to say that I, I think we feel very <laughs> very similar yeah. about this movie. Like you know, I was entertained for the the two or so hours that I was in the theater I never felt like I needed the the movie to pick itself up or I wanted to like step out and and use the restroom I was engaged but at the end of the day when I left the theater I was just left with of what consequence just happened in this film Mm -hmm. for such like a big broad idea to happen in this film you know to introduce Kang our really our big bad of the next like possibly two, three phases of the MCU moving forward and this Ant-Man movie being billed as like the start of it all. I just, I feel like a little empty at the end of the movie, right? You know, we we got all the fun, we got all the fun stuff that we expected to see in a movie starring Paul Rudd, right? You know, I would say all of the characters are very consistent and uh, our two additions, I would say maybe almost, possibly cancel each other out luckily yeah. with Jonathan Majors taking the win I would say oh, yeah. the two big additions are going to be uh, Paul Rudd's daughter which yeah. is added to the cast I don't remember the actress's name uh, Catherine um, Newton Catherine Newton and then Jonathan Majors and I, you know I feel like Catherine Newton and the the father daughter story is just not very strong it's really not adding much to the story except for maybe giving Paul Rudd uh, or Scott Lang, if you will, just a little bit more motivation to to move to, forward. It, well, I think to me, the, if you watch all three, yes, she's a staple. But like having this one be ten years older than the last time we saw her, it's jarring a little bit, right? Like, yeah, this isn't exactly. the girl from the first or second one. This is a whole different lady because you know there was the five year blip and however much time has passed since. Yeah, too. exactly. But I, I think, and I've seen this across the internet over the weekend. You know, of course, after I removed my uh, muted keywords on Twitter and I could finally uh, join the conversation, everybody I think across the board agrees that Jonathan Majors is great, right? Absolutely. And he he proved it before he even got into this movie, right? We got to see him as the one who remains at the end of season one of Loki. Uh, you can also check him out in the one and only season of Oh God. What's the show called? I already forgot the name of it. That was on HBO. Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country. Country. Yeah, and yeah, he he's in two other movies uh, coming to theaters this month. So yeah, and there's also uh, maybe one of them is what you're mentioning. There's something called like maybe like magazine story or magazine star or something like that. That's no. kind of being that that's kind of I guess in the film festival circuit right now, and he's being applauded and possibly. Oscar noms rumored for that role maybe coming next year. So like the, he is he is much like uh, uh, any version of Kang that you may or may not may or may look at. It, Jonathan Majors is at the height of his powers. He's got Creed yeah. three yes. that trailer in front of this movie. I just watched a TikTok clip of him talking about his like workout routine. This man eats six thousand calories a day. 
uh, through six meals and works out twice every day. And he said he did that for four months. But since he keeps getting work, he's going to have to keep doing that for like the next yeah. 20 years. This this man is dedicated to his craft and he is very, very good. Marvel, the sm- like that's like the smartest thing they did. Yeah. I don't know if they just got whispers of like him out there in the world or some very smart casting person was catching him in some early stuff, like maybe even Lovecraft Country. I think so. well, uh, didn't- some of the writers or some people who worked maybe on Lovecraft Country came to Marvel, um, and I think that might have been the not not to knock it. I mean, obviously he, they they know yeah. he, he had audition do, but I think that's how they got he got the notice in the the pink. Yeah, but so, obviously a highlight all around uh, for everybody. yeah. So yeah, so Jonathan Majors is great. I would say he is worth the price of admission. And you know, mm-hmm. I thought the Quantum Realm was you know interesting for the most part. Like when I kept. Uh, seeing all of these like you know interesting worlds and creatures i just kept thinking like oh yeah that's that movie strange worlds came out mm-hmm. I, I, that must be a, a slightly more saturated well, and with the brightness yeah, slider slid to, up for this version yeah I, and i think you know to, to, to add on that kind of bit like you know all the other ant-man movies we've seen have just been cityscapes right gray buildings yeah. concrete metal this was visually an entirely you know a 180 in the other direction but uh, and, and and honestly, some things that made me laugh. Obviously, these creatures, these worlds. Jeff Loveness, who was a writer on Rick and Morty, you know, wrote this movie, and I feel the Rick and Morty like yeah. multiverse aliens coming through. Uh, some of them were pretty fun, and we'll, we'll talk about those. You know, kind of when we get to. To some yeah, that, but, but yeah, but but overall, for all of these things that we're describing, right, like yeah. a quantum realm that exists between worlds, uh, Kang, this big baddie all of these weird unique creatures and like just the stakes have never been higher for this group of people and i you're just left with okay but this is what we're this is what happened Mm -hmm. during the movie it's just i do not feel affected right right? you you know uh, it, it was able to avoid me leaving the theater upset which has happened for me before in plenty of films right like, and, th- and that's the hard thing, right? This movie is sufficiently entertaining. This this is solidly uh, maybe the most mid-tier Marvel movie out there in the pact right now. Yeah. Um, but so when you talk about a movie like this at length, it's just going to be so much easier and honestly so much more fun to talk about things that we didn't like. So I'll preface after we finish this review after we talk about all of our spoilers, it's probably going to sound like we really didn't like this movie, but it's just because when a movie is just, movie's just mediocre, it's just, it's more well, fun just to talk about the things yeah. that you didn't like, you know, because the stuff that you like just is like, yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't, that's yeah, yeah. just kind of my yeah. hypothesis. I, I might lean us. the other way because <laughs> it's hard for me. There are things I know I, 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 they could do better maybe. And I don't think it's maybe things I don't like, but it's like things that maybe suggestions to elevate it. But you know, you, you bring up a good point. This movie is you know, like, and like I said, in five years, this movie will probably have a lot more weight when we realize the consequences, yeah, right? But well, it's just like the Incredible Hulk. It, nobody watched the Incredible Hulk when it came out. Nobody talked about it until it's literally in every everything in that movie is now touching every other MCU property down the road. And you're like, oh, I need to go back and rewatch that. But it, it, it in a I guess in its age, the MCU has... This is the 31st movie in Marvel, by the way. Not including TV shows. Like, 31 goddamn movies in wow. one thing. That's more than one season of TV, Mike, if you will. Um, that it, when you watch Iron Man 1, you don't know Thanos is coming, right? Like, obviously. I, I think this movie would have been way better served to not know the villain was Kang. Right? At, at the by, Like, in the marketing and the promotions. Like leave a reveal for something else like maybe even maybe lean into modok and don't hide modok as much make him the villain and then you find out it's kang right and then like oh my god everyone's talking but i just think you know you don't to introduce your villain now and be like okay well be ready this is your introduction and then just to be just okay in a movie like it, it it's not that you're starting out bad you're just not you know you're not running the hype machine at the start of your fate, your your two phases you're going to be using this guy for. Yes, um, exactly. And it's not it's, uh, it's not Kang's fault. Just the movie as all, but we we can jump into that here in just a yeah, minute. This is uh, yeah, great point. Let's jump into well, spoilers right now. Box office, just real fast. Um, okay. it, it is currently at 104 million domestic, which makes it the third movie ever to break 100 million in February, behind Deadpool and Black Panther one, uh, and is nearing 225 million internationally. Uh, and I don't 
know um, if uh, what Scream Six is out or coming out right. Um, might be the uh, only competition. It, I think it's I think it's the beginning of March when that one yeah. drops. So I, obviously, uh, you know, this is the highest Ant Man movie um, has ever um, made on a, on an opening mm-hmm. weekend. So people are are getting hyped. People are watching it. No no fear on recouping the money for this movie. Right at the end of the day. So. Um, all right, I'm going to mark it down right here. Now, uh, we are jumping in to spoilers right now, Territory Mike. Spoilers, you ready? Yeah, spoilers. Spoilers okay. for sure. Go. And I, I will do everyone the favor of putting this in the spoiler section because I was spoiled on this uh, before I went into the movie because uh, the, the hashtag for this movie is insanely long and complicated. With so many permutations, I missed the one hashtag that avoided me seeing the Rotten Tomato score before I oh. went into the movie, which I don't know, may have helped me, honestly. I saw that this movie was sitting at like 48%, mm-hmm. and I was like, what? That I mean, I know I didn't like Ant-Man and the Wasp all that much, but 48, that something seems off here. So I went into this movie expecting it just to just stink yeah. up the whole theater and the whole time i'm watching this movie i just i just keep thinking okay when's the really bad stuff supposed to happen right where's yeah. like the big stinking moment that's just like makes me roll my eyes and want to walk out and it really never happened so i was very conflicted watching this movie yeah. seeing the, how divided the critics are whether they think this movie is a recommendation or not so you know? it, it's currently sitting at 47 percent, and I, I i i had you know was it was revealed to me as well i'm sitting there i'm like Okay, well, I'm going to temper myself, right? The only other movie this low has been Eternals. And I wouldn't say Eternals was bad, but, like, you know, you you feel Eternals, right? When you're watching, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I know, I, know, I know what they're talking about. This one, I just don't. But this is one of the few movies on Rotten Tomatoes that has a very divided audience score. Um, mm-hmm. Sitting at 84%, uh, re- like, section. So, like, mi- critically, maybe I understand where the review's coming from, to get 47 from, from someone. Or is it just the hype to, like, oh... Well, Marvel's not making any good movies anymore, so obviously, you know, it, we're, it's cooler to say something. You're gonna get highlighted saying something bad about a Marvel movie than everyone who's always saying good things, right? Like, is it one of those deals in, in review world? I mean, is also it, I don't know. It it does feel like you know if you if you look at Rotten Tomato purely as what it's supposed to be, right? A recommendation engine of yep. a yes or a no, you should go see it, and you're not equating the percentages to like grades of a report card which you're not supposed to do that's not how it works it's the recommendation i could see it to a point of just like how we were saying chris nothing of consequence truly happens in this movie except for maybe giving us a little bit more flavor on what a variant of kang is capable of and the post-credit scene of showing us all of the different variations of kang because really all of the character arcs in this movie are so weak like i could not really pluck out one given theme that carries this movie forward especially if you look at our main character of scott lang because chris even though this is an ant-man and the wasp movie yeah. it, they should have just taken wasp out of the title uh, exa- wasp yeah she she really took a back to seat to, and that's and that's okay honestly i think you know she really they even started off, she's like, oh, she's doing fine. She's running a business. Like, she really had no barriers to get across, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. the, the one thing I will say between all the Ant-Man and Wasp movies, the relationship between, um, you know, uh, Paul Rudd and uh, Evangeline Lilly, it's non-existent. It happens in between the movies. So when they're, like, at the end, like... I had to come back for you and get you, and you know they kiss. I'm like, oh my god! I was, it was like, so I, weird when I was they, like, when they they kissed and said I loved you. It's yeah. just like if somebody had never seen an Ant Man movie before and watched this, they wouldn't even have would, known they even were a felt couple. It. Yeah, until it, the very it, end of the movie. Yeah. Uh, I would say the biggest, you know, along with that, you know, thing, and and the the one thing I would say about this movie that 47 percent, right? Um, that means 40, uh, 4.7 out of 10 people. So five out of 10 people would say. Yes, watch it. The other five would say, no, don't watch it, right? Like, uh-huh. very much. And that's how I said I sit down in the middle. I would rank this 50% on an MCU score, right? Right in the middle. Uh-huh. Um, I feel that's applicable. But at the same time, this is not the worst Ant-Man movie. This is not the worst yes, MCU true. movie. And those all rank higher than Tomato Meter. So, like, I, it, it's very, very hard for me to take this number seriously because it's like, what what is the goal here? Well, um, it, it's almost like too if if we are to tr- I think we if we are to review the story structure of the MCU more akin to a TV show right because it's it, it just shares more of its DNA with a structure like that yeah. if this is supposed to be your season premiere 
of your new season, right? Like I would say, yeah, I don't think I would be that that excited about episode one of this season, right? But you know, I'm a fan, so I'll keep watching. And you know, usually when you go on like TV shows and you look at their reviews on IMDb, they'll be all over the place. You'll have yeah. fans that hate episodes and love episodes. So I know well, it kind of seems like a weird way of like I'm trying to like defend the movie. It's more like I'm just trying to rewire my brain to figure out how Whoa. to judge 31 right. movies in a in a yeah. in a franchise it's wild well I, well I just pulled up you know uh, again rotten tomatoes top i usually go to top critics right cuz you know if you mm-hmm. have a publication you can be a critic like one of them's like 0 out of 5 i'm like this movie out of every fucking movie made it, you gave this one a 0 out of 5 like w- i i don't understand the reviewer's criteria anymore and i think that's what's really kind of bothering me about like you know like oh, it's 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 one of the worst Marvel. Movies. It's not. It's not one of the worst Marvel movies ever. It's not one of the worst movies ever. I've seen way worse. You yeah, know, and uh, it, and this feels like a flashback to when we were talking about Eternals, yeah. where it's like there. This movie, it, the Eternals, is not that bad. But it seems like everyone's kind of bringing their own. I don't want to say baggage, but they're just bringing their own relationship to this like thirty plus movie franchise when they go to review it, and that just might be an unattended consequence, right, of having this huge synergistic franchise of like you just can't control the way everybody has a relationship to it right so maybe that's where all these weird you know reviews are coming yeah, from but i i but i think the more we talk about it the more it is the decisiveness yeah. there it makes a little bit more sense yeah. i guess well if, if i just don't quite understand like you know if you were to lay out all your movies and like you know as a reviewer should right um mm-hmm. and you're like okay what you know one out of four is what i'm looking at here or like uh, this movie winds up being confusing. There was nothing confusing about this movie. I would actually say it was predictable to a fault. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know exactly why they're doing it. There's nothing confusing here. So I don't quite, again, I, I, I don't use Rotten Tomatoes as a basis for anything at all. I It, it is it is absolutely, um, it become something that, like you mentioned, something that's not, people rely on it as a grading score, not an actual what it should be mm-hmm. kind of score. And um, for me, I'm just like I, I can't, I can't, I can't take it seriously. But at, at the end of the day, like I, 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 I said, some of my my complaints would be it's a very predictable movie. Everything mm-hmm. in this, I applaud it jumping into the quantum realm from the start. Right, like I actually thought we were gonna have a dragged out like Earth moment for mm-hmm. a while, but they were like, oh hey, here's what we're working on. Boom, we're in the quantum. Realm. I'm like, Great, finally. Like there's no, there's no San Diego to look at. Right, there's no, you know meetings or buildings uh to, to to jump into so that was fantastic um i i really like the visuals of this i and and how i i thought of you during this mike because they explained like hey why didn't we see this when we were in the quantum realm? like well you, you there are multiple parts of the quantum realm it's not just one look for everything right they were like oh you didn't see this because you didn't look in the right place you were looking out in the, like the outer wilds of yeah, yeah i mean you're on the outskirts of the city you were looking at the outskirts of the city, not the city So that's why things kind of look different. I I thought that was nice. Uh, But also, I feel like, too, they've just done a a fairly good job of just saying the quantum realm is just a very mysterious place. You know, they said it exists between universes. So in my mind, I don't really think of it as like a landmark location. It's almost just kind of more this amorphous zone where just things can happen. So when I then we when we meet all of these like weird characters and creatures and people that look like humans. I'm really not all bent out of shape that, you know, some look like humans and some look weird. I'm just like, oh, this is just a weird place. This is just kind of like an alternate version of outer space in a way. Yeah. And I was okay with that for the yeah. most part because I was like, oh, this is just weird. They're going to do some like weird stuff down in the quantum realm. And also it makes sense for why Kang would be banished to the quantum realm. If you kind of think of like in Marvel comics, like negative zone prisons yeah. and stuff like that. Okay, this the, the logically all of this makes sense. And like you said, Chris, it, it nothing is confusing. It all makes sense, and it is uh, predictable in a way. So yeah, I don't really have a problem with like the world building or anything like that. It's just I feel like almost all of this comes down to the characters, mm-hmm. which is interesting because I feel like that's usually the, not how our reviews go. Yeah, uh, and it's just and it's just like uh, I, the weakest character in the film, a hundred percent, is Michelle Pfeiffer's character. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I do not understand the. I I I feel like somebody would indeed have. People PTSD for being stuck in the quantum realm for 30 years, right? But she's getting so mad that they're experimenting with the quantum realm, right? 
but it's just like you haven't told them anything. You have a lack of communication problem yeah. here, so you cannot get mad well, that they're doing the, something. The, you want know the you know, be- that you've been been clear about. <laughs> you know what the best part of that is? It lasted like five mm-hmm. seconds. She's mm-hmm. like, T- shut it down, and then like, up oh, too late, blew up. Like you're like, oh, now you're in the quantum. Like, like, like they didn't really drag on her thing, and I think that's why I'm like, I can, I don't forgive it, but I'm like, I don't remember. I didn't think about it until you know. Again, you brought it up. I'm like, yeah, but you know, I think it's um. It's not the actors, right? Acting, acting, even Michelle Pfeiffer, fantastic actress. Yeah, you know, still out for all this time. It's mm-hmm. the 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 motivation for the characters. I don't quite understand, right? Kang wants to leave, and he's like, um, and Ant Man, like he just happens to the teams coincidentally split up. This is very much Empire Strikes Back scenario, right? Where the teams split mm-hmm. up early on, they have to to reconvene. I just feel like no one like by the time it's all convenient and how they get there right like it's like oh yeah your timing's perfect everything's exactly where it should be the army of ants shows up in the, in their 11th hour mike you know they're defeated king's gonna blow them all up or make them disappear with his blue uh, gooey things and the ants show up you're like yep this is this is exactly what was gonna happen there's no there are no surprises here i do i would say modok as an act like on the whole like showing up and and having um I, I can't forget. I don't know the actor's Corey, name. Corey Stoll. Corey Stoll as, as Darren come back and, and like Ooh. him talking and how he was like becoming thing. And then his naked little butt uh, whenever he was pulling out thing. <laughs> All right. let's, let's, pretty entertaining. Let's talk, I enjoyed let's, MODOK. Let's talk about MODOK since he's here. Uh, yeah. I have very mixed feelings about MODOK, right? Yeah. Um, I, I Visually, his design on the exterior uh, looks great. I love how he's just kind of a minion of Kang running yeah. around like, killing people he has these kind of just almost like wacky like armament system that's popping off of him oh, yeah. feels very comic booky right yeah and i know i kind of defended the look of the humanoid underneath it when we saw a brief look of it yeah, in the yeah. trailer a couple weeks ago on the on the on the show but that was a very side clip and everything and i i think you could even quote me saying like what modok is just has like a He's big just, head what oh, were you he, expecting he this is, is a big, big head. head yeah but uh, I feel like the execution of the head, once I finally got to see it in the movie, it was a little off. I was kind yeah. of getting those like vibes of when people kept showing that very weak VFX shot from Thor Love and Thunder of that kid doing like the telekinesis oh, yeah. or, or whatever. I was just like, is this kind of what, what happened here? Because it looks like in Photoshop when you hit the transform tool and you just stretch left to well, right. Uh, and it's just, I, I don't know. That's, I, that's, I just feel that's like kind of what happened to, to him though, right? Like he got I, stretched I, and I get it, but... It needs. I feel like it just needed to be plussed up a little oh. bit more. I'm not saying the the general idea of a big Darren's head in there isn't what they achieved, but I almost thought like maybe like the cranium gets like changed a little bit or something. I don't know. Like so we we, my- we follow we follow and we and we love the concept designers uh, for Marvel, and I'm sure there is a litany of designs on yeah. a piece of paper of how Darren's face was yeah. going to translate to Modoc, right? So I think this just really mostly came down to a creative decision. Uh, I don't know if it was Peyton Reed or he delegated to, to somebody else, but I just, I firmly believe there is a version of this character and concept art that I would have preferred much more to look at. I, well, I don't, I didn't want to prefer to look at him. I think, I think the point is he is a gross, disgusting little man and, uh, and that's what he is. I think to me the biggest part is that he refers to himself as Modok. Um, w- was there some sort of brainwashing involved? Like it's like he didn't. Re- he knows he was Darren, but he doesn't remember anything. Right? He's like, oh, I'm now a mobile organism designed only for like. Kang didn't come up with that name. Like mm-hmm. I don't buy this for one second. His name and that he's that, that that's who he thinks he is. Right? Like at, at the end of the day, he 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 changed sides because Cassie told him don't be a dick, which it was a pretty funny conversation back and forth in a. For a Marvel movie, did not expect that to happen for like back mm-hmm. and forth for a little bit, I, and I, I think he he should be gross to look at. Like I don't, I, I I'm I'm fine with him being in. It was I think to me, if anything, I think the Uncanny Valley was a little wonky, right? Like it was too real I think in the that, face. But I think I think that's fair too, and I think that's that's why I think like it needed some more maybe flourishes along the side of his face where it connected to the helmet. I don't know, just to kind of take it out of this range of like, I'm just looking at his face transformed on the X axis. It's just what it felt like to me. Yeah. So, you know, to me, I think they tried too hard to make it look real, like, like a real person. And they could have like, 
leaned in a little bit, maybe more into the goofiness of of Mo, like kind of like the the what the Patton Oswalt show on Hulu, right? The, the, like like he yeah. he's more vertical. It wasn't wide. It was a little more vertical. Can like I, I think they could have been a little more wonky with it and and played with it instead of trying to make it look too real. But you know, it it, it was fun. They still like. He, I think he's a funny character because he's like he doesn't know what he is. We don't know what he is or what he's doing. And um, now, now he's officially dead, though. By the way, Darren, Darren is is gone from this. Yeah, and and, and the thing is with his character too. I I do. We did get to see the moment right where you know Kang kind of like turns on him in a way in that hallway, and yeah. he's like, "No, you don't talk with me in the presence of me." Yeah. And I think that is in an attempt to uh, justify, you know, Darren's sacrifice at the end of the movie where he takes down, you know, King's shield with an explosion. But since Darren is acting so just weird and bizarre through the whole movie and just like almost like a cartoon character... It, like I like it's gonna sound weird, but like I didn't feel the abuse, like if you will, like it just seemed like well, a weird like turn yeah, to absolutely. just all of a sudden go against the, you know. Modok, Modok is more of a Star Scream and Transformers kind of character, right? Like he's not in command, he's second in command, but he's always plotting to take over. And I think that point of that character base, right, where yes. He might be second in command to Kang, but he he is planning to defeat Kang at some point. He's going to betray him, and that was that would have been the moment, right, right there. That would have if we'd had any indication that he was like, uh, yes, I owe my life to Kang, but I I want to be in control. I want to be the leader. You never get that from him at all. Mm-hmm. He, he's just like a little rabid dog. He's like, yeah, go go get him, and then you know he can be literally bought or swayed very easily right i don't they should have played up if he, he like maybe had some damage to him yeah um like maybe when he shrank like you know he doesn't he's got partial amnesia or he's like maybe um very mood swingy if you will but Ooh. but they they they, they kind of left he's a i'd say he's a minor character right i think his weapons make him you know kind of cool at the end of this but um yeah absolutely i i uh i really like king's um I guess ship and world like planet design like his his like the the, the ring thing moving around. Uh, I know we saw it in the trailers, but to see kind of everything in action, I thought was interesting. Like the visuals are leaning for for the the king yeah, stuff. Yeah, they, they they do a good job in most aspects, making Kang seem very ominous and unstoppable for the most part. Some of the main cast get plot armor yeah. in the very last scene when fighting Kang, uh, which is a little confusing. But yeah, I, I I believe Kang the Conqueror, the way they kind of build him up. And I like narratively how they did it too. You you mentioned it earlier, how they only talk of Kang in the first half of the And they movie. don't even and mention his name. They're like, he yeah. is looking for you. Like, yeah, and then you get to meet him, which kind of really builds up his mystique. So I, I truly believe that a man of his kind of uh, means could kind of crash land and in the middle of nowhere, uh, not unlike um, oh, what do they what do they call him in uh, Stranger Things? What's the bad guy's name now? Ve- Vecna. Uh, Vecna. Like kind of, it kind of felt Vecna style, like landing in this kind of like almost like barren world and like crafting it and making it your own. Yeah. Like I think that shows like the the capabilities of mm-hmm. Kang, and I did I did enjoy. I did enjoy that. But now um, one thing that was interesting, now that you're kind of talking about the city and the world and just overall, um, the shrinking and growing, right? To me, it feels a little bit more effective in the real world when we're more familiar with scale Scale, on a personal level. Because uh, when like they're going giant and they're shrinking, but they're in this just kind of technological, just everything's kind of like red and pink hued like Mm -hmm. world. I'm just like, how big is he right now? Is this the biggest he's ever been? I mean, he looks big, but I mean, he's fighting a giant like um, laser beam Gatling gun tower. But I don't know how big that tower is power is yeah. so uh, i'm not saying it wasn't cool but like that is one thing that i've noticed and that could possibly be uh, uh something that other creative filmmakers like take note moving forward when when you're dealing with like scales of characters it is very very helpful to have something humanoid you well, know nearby that well, your audience think, can kind of gauge things and i think they tried to do that by having the wasp on his shoulder when he showed up right and then mm-hmm. i was like Actually, is she shrunk? Like someone yeah, else who can exactly. size? She, you know, like, <laughs> is he normal size and she's small, or is he big and she's regular size? I don't know. Yeah. Um. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I agree with that. I think that I, I like. I, I did enjoy the uh, cannonball throw there at the end. Mm-hmm. That was that was a very unique problem solving that um you know uh, 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 Scott Lang would I think yeah. only Scott Lang would, would come up with. 
Uh, before I forget, Bill Murray's in this movie. Uh, briefly, yeah, very, very brief, <laughs> very briefly, right? Uh, fun. Uh, it's like just enough to get a, his own character poster, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, he, not long enough of have much consequence. He, he he plays essentially what I thought was the mayor of Whoville, uh, but down down the quantum yeah. realm. <laughs> Yeah, and he could still be alive. You know, yeah. he was grappled by his uh, his lunch or his hors d'oeuvre, if you will. Yeah. We don't technically see him die, so he could pop up again at some point in time. I almost thought we'd see him maybe in an after credit scene, oh, yeah. but I, I thought we were going to get like maybe a goofy after credit scene uh-huh. and then like a serious one. No, we got two serious two ones. Two serious ones, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, Bill Murray, you know, he's he, he, he was welcome to see yeah. in the film, but uh, as like a theme through across this film, not much consequence happening there no. except to kind of let us know that um that it, uh this Michelle was, Pfeiffer was she was living a it, life she was getting her she was getting her cat woman yeah, on down there well and, and that was very much you know that's the the uh Star Wars cantina scene right like there's a lot mm. of Star Wars homages in this and that was your Star Wars cantina scene a- absolutely um real quick the other speaking of other characters right we had um the introduction uh introduction of Quaz or Quaz who is the the telepath, uh, Gentora, uh, who was the... She had that really cool staff that, like, disintegrated people or something. Like, they didn't really uh-huh. disintegrate. They, like, kind of warped together. Uh, and then uh, Veb, who has holes, by the way, if you wanted to know. <laughs> uh, who yes, was, he finally did it. Uh, Veb was voiced by David Dastmalchian, who uh, normally... Play, he played the guy who does the Baba Yaga scenes in the other Ant-Man movies. Oh, so that's how they were able to to bring to, him to sneak some more of them. In. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for that. Um, so I think they were fine. I, I I enjoyed you know the the characters again. If you took these character models out and put them in the Guardians movie, I would not notice the difference. Like they look yeah. just like people in space. And I know this is just another universe, and you know obviously you're going to see some similarities, but very much a very parallel between Quantum yeah. Realm and. and Space. But 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 speaking of kind of maybe the uh, the common folk of the quantum realm, I, I don't know if this makes me sound like a monster or maybe this is more of a Peyton Reed issue. I never once felt sympathy for these people oh, that no. I just met moments ago. I didn't care if Kang wiped them out. I didn't care if they won, which made it very difficult for uh, kind of Cassie's, you know, um, desire message. to be a hero and help people i just didn't feel i didn't care it didn't matter it really worked against kind of this whole theme that if i had to hang this movie on a theme it was that scott has this desire to finally take a step back and just be there for his daughter but his daughter kind of wants to be a hero so he has to kind of square that but I don't think it's addressed super well and if anything I am on Scott Lang's side I know they try to make him seem like annoying at the beginning of the movie where he's just like well I did save the whole world it's like yeah 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 we get it you wrote a book about it but at the same time like yeah he did save the world and also like helped in contributing with saving the entire universe I don't yep. think you should be so hard on the guy if he kind of wants to retire or take a sabbatical or something. Mm-hmm. So like when Cassie and all of the other characters as well are getting in his face about like not like, I guess, hanging up the suit, yeah. even though they would never really demonstrated that, that he really kind of retired in a way. I was like, give the man a break. Yeah. He's been well, in prison. You- He's been in a different dimension trapped. It, like, And that's the thing that drove me crazy is you're taking like these very logical, sane characters and you're kind of just making them jerks oh, well, just so you can per- uh, propel your main character. But have you watched the more. other two movies? They're the same way to him in those movies as well. Uh, a man of the wasp they hated him because he used the particles to fight in in germany right and then they were like we don't want to talk to you the whole movie and then yeah. this one is so, just, it's so just now he's over. just like, like so he's giving them what they want he's like yeah. fine he's yeah. like fine i'll i'll let it all out i'll leave it there and they're like no you need to mm. it's just like it just kind of hank's made like me hank like, hank is getting action again he's like actually hold on a second i found what i'm looking for put me back in i want to i want to do this it, some more yeah, it just it just kind of made me made me uh, yeah. mad in it's, a way it, of just like we need to propel our characters yeah. uh, with a little bit more uh, force. And I just that. and I think some things that would have helped would have been smaller moments, right? Like if you know the Kang forces were attacking the 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 I guess the wild people, if you will, and he was able to help like kids and families, right? Like oh my god, I'm actually making a difference, saving them, rather than just a plethora of probably adult humanoids and 
weird alien creatures and the spaceships could attack people. I think that would have helped, right? Like, it missed the little moments that make these movies yeah. important, and it, it just didn't have any little moments. I think the littlest yeah. ones were probably with Kang and um, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, um, Janet, uh, you know, kind of like, but that was because they were the only two people on screen for a while. Uh, you know, that that was their story. Um yeah, do do we do we dare dive into the end credits though? Because um I I I think we should. It was there must have been a different creative team, Chris, yeah. on this council of uh Kangs because why did they look so goofy? Like the one in the Fu Manchu style mustache, like that how did that get approved? Like, I'm not saying, like, culturally or respectively. He just looked like a goofy, wacky cartoon character. Well, and I'm like, it, aren't I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be taking the scene seriously, it, right? It doesn't feel like they I, want me to. Well, I would say, one one thing I would say is they, they really lean into their comic book origins. I can, I could, I, as soon as I saw all three of those, the, the, the main three, I guess, variants, right? I'm like, that's Ramatut, that is um, Immortus, and that is the Silver Centurion, like, right away. Like, they've leaned into that, but I don't know if they really gave, maybe they gave him, like, hey, we really want these to all be different personalities. Like, the the Ramatut one, not, not Ramatut, Immortus, was, um, like, he kind of looked like ashy gray and, like, spoke in that weird, like, raspy voice. Um, mm-hmm. The Ramatut one kind of had, like, a smirk on his face, right? Like, he's like, oh, God. And then the Silver Centurion just looked like a like they tried to like I guess young him up a little bit like as like a, mm-hmm. a younger person. I, I this was probably the only thing I think this scene and the next post credit scene we'll talk about are the only things I think that carry forward importantly in the MCU right. Like this is the kickoff of Phase Five and Six. Well, only because of the 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 sixty second post credit scene where it literally shows, hey, this variant, uh, you know, if he can be killed, even though we exile him, we're gonna go take take care of business over here if he if he can kill one of us he can kill more of us and that's what we're gonna do so i feel we're gonna see this lead into again the king dynasty not maybe that that king but another variant um and secret wars but i was i was blown away that they were able like hey jonathan we need you to play 50 versions of your character real fast uh, can we throw you on this green screen and you just pretend you're doing different mm-hmm. things uh, and I sent you the. Did I send you the comic panel that is based on? There's actually a book. No. Um. So it is based directly from Avengers, I believe, two ninety two. Um. And um. I will send you the panel that is that's based on here, and uh, absolutely nails it from the comic book. I, that doesn't mean anything to anybody else, like right, unless you know. But like, uh, um, I just I just googled it. Yeah, I see it here. Yeah, even the weird, goofy looking melting the melted face uh, one. Yeah, Kang, yeah, is is in there. So yeah, I mean uh, that's great that they leaned into that. It just almost yeah. felt like it was like a rushed scene in a way of just like just throw some makeup on I, these people, get it going. I it felt like it did. It just did not run through the normal checks and balances. I don't think like to me. I don't think it's rushed. I think this is one of those secrecy issues again, right? Like. Who, who was the crew that did this? How few people were on it so no one would find out they had Jonathan Majors playing all the... Because even I didn't know about this. And I, 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 I look pretty hard for some of this stuff sometimes. Like when I'm doing our show notes, I'm like, I didn't even know they were doing this scene. So like how few was how few of the crew were there? And like, hey, look, we need like, you know, your top five people who can keep a secret. But like maybe they're not the best yeah. five people we have on board or maybe we needed 20. But like... We only can use five. Let's get this done. But I agree, it, it yeah. does feel a little wonky. Uh, yeah. Visually. Now, 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 for me, it was the second post credit scene, and unfortunately, the second post credit scene was the only time in the theater where I kind of felt the magic a little bit in a way mm-hmm. of being at the cinema, uh, because we got to see another close up of Kang yes. in like a an old timey theater. I was like, oh this is this is great. We we know that he was a scientist yep. and he was like the first one to like learn how to manipulate time and do this. Oh this is the origin of this. This is super cool. And then it cuts to oh it's a scene from the next season of Loki. We see yep. Tom Middleston and um uh what's Owen, his face? Owen Wilson. So this is Victor oh, Timely. So we actually reported on this in the news that this was going to be in the show Loki um uh, a while back and little did i know that they would pulled it to put it in this movie now victor timely is actually a in the comic books he was a version of king 
that he went back to like the early like or er, late 1800s and 1900s to hide and literally like I'm going to be here and lay um, things for me to succeed in like a hundred years, right? Like so, hey, like um, was it Back to the Future, right? Where um, Doc sends the message to to Marty from the the West. He's like, hey, you're going to get this immediately whenever I the, the car disappears. Here, uh, here's the message. That's exactly what Victor Timely is doing, or a little bit. So, but it was really cool to see again another variant of Kang. Jonathan Majors is going to like rule our fucking next five years in the MCU. Um, and um, again, you know, uh, Loki and Mor- not Morbius, Mobius, uh, back <laughs> at it because that, that's this a great show. We do know that it's coming, you know, later this year on Disney Plus for sure. Um, last thing before we, I, I don't want to drag this on forever because we do have a regular show. Let's go. I I loved. I, I loved, love, love Mike more than I should have. I laughed in the theaters. Baskin, Robbins, Scott Lang. <laughs> and, and the pile of Ant-Mans, which is like a Nexus thing. I thought that was a really cool visual. is very fun. But like the Baskin, Robbins, like of all the one, the decisions he did, he's just, he's just a regular guy who's just stayed working at Baskin, Robbins forever. And he's like, why are we here? Uh, this, who wants what? ice cream? And I'm like, I love that- this. It was so, it was perfect Paul Rudd. If I, yeah, can say that. I, I don't know who exactly, you know, in the first Ant-Man movie, right? You know, okay, we got to give Scott like, you know, an ex-con ch- type of job that he's not going to like and is going to feel demeaning to him because he's in a, he's a grown adult, right? Uh, let's put him in like a pink apron at Baskin Robbins, right? So at that point in time, I'm curious, like, oh, do we make it just, um, just any old ice cream place? Oh, maybe there's like a synergy person, you know, <laughs> that like reaches out, hey, Baskin Robbins, you want to be in this movie? Whatever Baskin Robbins person out there agreed to this, just they made out like a bandit because this is a thread that has continued through the franchise and now in like in one of the pivotal scenes in the movie when you're just thrown in front of thousands and thousands of ant-man there's one pink guy that just has the baskin robbins logo on it so i guess like not not to applaud not to applaud uh corporate capitalism but like you know they got lucky uh good for them (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely and i think Paul Rudd, you know, it, it felt, you know, it felt right for him to do that for some, like, does that make sense? Like, yeah, it's, it's Paul Rudd being goofy. Like, that is him at, at at the core of Paul Rudd. And this version of Scott Lang, it just felt right. It nailed, it nailed, yeah. nailed it perfectly. So, yeah. So, and I, before we, ca- before we cap off this, you might already know this answer. So if you think you know the answer for sure, you, you know, maybe don't tell me or maybe like make it a little cloak and dagger and maybe say, oh, this might be what happening. But uh, Kang says that there is a big threat coming. And if he's not around to take care of it, you'll feel sorry about it and then scott even freaks out mm-hmm. when he gets back to earth when he's walking down the sidewalk and when he, this pops up back to his brain i mean are we to assume possibly that this is galactus you know is galactus a big enough threat that spans like multiversal scenarios where king would be worried about him i'm not too sure or is it just kind of more of like a more of a amorphous of just like oh the timelines and incursions are all gonna like destroy every part of existence you want me around to keep it all in check i'm not sure but it is do you think he's hinting towards a specific person like galactus no uh no i um i don't know the answer i'll, I'll tell you that right now Mm-hmm. My this is exactly what he said when he was playing He Who Remains. Mm-hmm. It's like there is something like if you kill me, something else is coming. It it, it it I to me it is that council of kings, right? The the army of kings is what's coming. And I feel the post credit scene maybe was that answer. I would love to be you know again proven wrong. We would like to be surprised. We we love we love that. So I, I I'm not gonna say that's the answer, but like. To me, that's kind of what it feels like because there is that parallel between um, what he said is he who remains and what actually, you know, he said in the movie as well. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll see. But I, I um... don't, I don't want it to be Galactus because I want that to be outside of this king. Uh, mm. Tra- uh, I guess well, story, if you will. It, it weirdly enough almost seems like too small, right? To yeah. have all of this big universal, multiversal stuff happening, right? And then it's just kind of like one, even I, I know Galactus is ginormous, right? But just having one specific entity be the threat, it yeah. almost seems like we need to go through this secret war, incursion, universe, mm. singularity stuff, so the MCU can kind of get back to just having one yeah. universe, and then 
here comes Galactus. Yeah. Nom, nom, nom. I'm hungry. I only have this one universe and I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Well, well, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, uh, my my theory, um, and I don't know if it's in our regular show notes, actually, uh, but, like, what if what if the movies in Phase 6, like, all the villains for those movies are just Galact or Kang variants? Like, he is the literally the villain of every movie because it's the Kang dynasty in that, that era. And, like, it's just, like... This one has Immortus, this one has Ramatut, this one has Silver Centurion, this one's got the the Melty Face dude as the villain, right? Like, what if that's what they do, and then, like, again, Galactus would be the one at the end that we really want to build towards, because I think that's the, yeah, maybe. That's the important one. To, to me, that's, like, right, like, you, you mentioned, like, you like I think Kane could beat Galactus by, like, well, look, I'm just going to do laps around you the whole time, rather than actually, you know, um, do anything. But anyway, yeah, I just want to come back to you before we forgot, like, the... The, the 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 multitude of Ant Mans and Wasps that we saw at, at the end there. I thought that was a really cool, uh, really cool touch to that at the end of the day. So, all right, Mike. Anything else you want to add before this we get out of here? I mean, no. I mean, I think that's. I think we wrapped I, it up pretty well. Of just uh, a, lot, a lot of things of consequence could come out of this movie, yep. but as of right now, you're just kind of left going like, eh, we're just waiting. Movie. We're just waiting, and I I. I feel they could do an Ant Man four, um, but if they do, it needs to. I I wouldn't say it needs to do a Thor Ragnarok. It doesn't need to change that book bag, but it needs to be again. I think you agree, better focused on the story and 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 the character building, right? The character arcs in there. So, um, hundred percent think they'd have a four. But we'll we'll talk more about that later. So, Mike, if people know what you're up to, what you're doing, where can they find you at, my man? Oh, they can find me at Mike Royer Design on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can read my web comics at pickledcomics.com. Chris, if people want to catch up with you, where can they find you? Find me on Instagram, Valdan87, V A L D A N. Or literally, you can find me on Superhero Slate every week. I think that's the best place to catch up with me because I post on there every week for sure. On my other social media, uh, you'd be lucky if you find me. Uh, so, um, but yes, but if you want to listen to the Superhero Slate show that we do every week, where can I find all that goodness at? Oh, the best place to find our headquarters is SuperheroSlate.com. That is the best place to find all the avenues we host our show. On our normal weekly news episodes, we have killer show notes that we post up there on the website. And also our upcoming release calendar. I believe the next movie we're talking about is Shazam! Fury of the Gods. That is, I yes, think that's, yes. that's mid-March. Yeah, tickets are on sale, I found out, because only I was in the theaters, not because they didn't post <laughs> anything about it. But yeah, continue. Yeah, so that'll be the next one we talk about. So if you want to see that calendar, if you want to see our show notes, head on over to SuperheroSlate.com. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can get merch, SuperheroSlate.com slash store. We love hearing from you. Reach out. Let us know what you thought about Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Uh, Were you meh? Were you hmm? Were you meh? Uh, I, I know that was strange, the noises I just made, but let me know what you thought about them. And we love our super fans of this show. So if you want to be a super fan of Superhero Slate, mm-hmm. it's very easy. All you have to do is share the show with a friend, share the show with a buddy, and we will be here every week, folks. Or you can send us like ten bucks. You know, I'll make we'll, we'll give you super fan stuff <laughs> for ten bucks. We'll, ver- we'll yeah, ver- sure. you'll get verification check mocks uh, <laughs> saying that you're a super we'll fan. We'll give you two factor authentication as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We'll uh, see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.